بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. Uh, so last week we left off on a bit of a dark note with uh, Ghazali where, where he started talking about how an individual ends, ends up somewhat defeated uh, if he, uh, you know, depending on how he allows desires to overtake him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. What he actually does in this next chapter is a little bit more uplifting. And this is how to find symptoms in the diseases that we have in that are in our heart and this is where we actually start exploring and start discovering on what are some of those things i should look for in my character what are some of those things i should look for in myself in order to better that and i think that's something that's really important and it's it's where uh there's a, there's a big shift because everything until now has been more of an explanation uh, actually helping us understand some of the concepts helping us understand some of the symptoms helping us understand some of the uh, the medicines that were there and why some of the the sufi sheikhs speak the way that they do and why some of those uh, treatments come off as somewhat somewhat extreme in some cases so one of the first things that he talks about is how do you determine a symptom? How do you like, and what does that actually lead to? And what does that actually entail? So if an, un if an individual is unable to strike, he probably has a problem with, hands. with his hands, right? And if an individual is unable to see, he probably has a problem with huh? his eyes. And this is something that's very clear, something that's very straightforward. And he begins with this example because it's very easy to see. It's very easy for us to relate to versus diseases of the heart, which are, which are far more difficult to analyze, right? They're, they're more difficult to actually perceive. And the reason for that is because it's something that we actually haven't trained ourselves to do. And because we haven't trained ourselves to do it, it makes us that much more challenging. Uh, even, even nowadays, there's a big push in what, what type of health? And mental health. And why is there a big push in mental health? Because it's become, yeah, well, I mean, uh, number one, because it's like a huge industry and there's a lot of money in it, right? <laughs> and and the, sec the second reason is because it was something that really wasn't explored before, right? It wasn't something that people spend a lot of time and they didn't really understand it really well. But even during Lozadi's time, what, what examples is he giving here? He's not giving examples of anxiety and depression. He's actually giving physical examples that have to do with physical health because this is something historically mankind has, been learn has learned to actually deal with and has learned to uh, bring treatments for. So the first thing he talks about are the things that he talks about uh, that are symptomatic to some of the problems. And he talks about these being the basis, base characteristics that an individual should find in a sound heart. From them is learning, uh, from them is wisdom, from them is love and recognition. And when we talk about recognition here, what type of recognition do you think Ghazali is talking about? Okay, recognition of the truth. I think that's very good. That's a good way of putting it. But when we say truth, what does that mean? I'm sorry. Like reflecting. reflecting on what? What am I? What am I doing here? If okay, that's that's part of it. What else? Ah, ascent, right? It's recognizing Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and recognizing Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is one of the what Ghazali he actually talks about. This is this characteristic. Ma'rifa is the one thing. Uh, so, um, the, you guys know how this was translated in the book? It's translated as gnosis, um, it's, which, which, is, which is a bit of a uh, obscure word. I didn't, I didn't really care for the translation too much, but I, I like recognition a lot more, and I think it's something a little bit more palatable and something that's easier for us to understand. So the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are some things and what are some skills that, that, give, that give a human being the ability to recognize Allah? And he says that this is the skill. This is the characteristics that sets us apart from, from the animals. So what is so important about this recognition? And what are some things that we might have, or what are some tools that we might have to help us in the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, hmm. Okay, so how do I even know that those are his sifat? How can I trust that those are his sifat? The Quran, huh? the Quran tells us, how can I trust the Quran? Ah, All right, it, it, immutable. Okay, based on what? How do I know it's immutable? So, so the thing is, there has to be a number of things. There have to be logical steps that actually bring me to understand and believe that Islam is true, right? There are steps before that. Alhamdulillah, we're all at a place where we believe the Quran is true, yes? But there has to be something that brought us to that point, right? We had to have been convinced at some point that Islam is correct. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't be praying. We wouldn't be doing any of the things that we do. And if we're doing them just by action and just by custom or just because we're raised like that, then that's something that needs to be analyzed and looked at too. 
right? Because we said that the basis of Iman is Yaqeen, is conviction. How does a person develop this conviction? How does he develop Yaqeen? By constantly questioning and constantly challenging. Uh, delight. Delight, yani, when he talks about delight here, what is he talking about? Like enjoying a, a banana split? Huh? What is he talking about enjoying? Spiritual practice. Right, spiritual practice, practice. ibadat, right? He's talking about enjoying ibadat and actually taking delight in them. They don't feel like a chore anymore. You look forward to praying. You look forward to making dua. You look forward to reading Quran. You look forward to giving sadaqah. You look forward to all of these things. And when you enjoy them, then this is a level, this is a plateau that an individual actually reaches. He actually talks about preference, meaning that every time you're given a choice between doing something that pleases Allah and something that doesn't, what do you do? Oh, you always, it's not even a, you know, it becomes so natural and so innate in us that we are constantly move in that direction that it becomes part of our character, right? Remember, all of these are character traits. And this is the, this is the driving point of Ghazali. When he talks about how an individual develops taqwa, he links that very closely with developing what? Mm, character, Hassan. Right, and finally, devotion. Right, so devotion is something that he he spends a lot of time on. Devotion meaning that now you've put on these blinders, and everything that you do is for, for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And ma'rifah. So again, this is something that we said was extremely fundamental. This recognition, this ability to recognize our Creator, this ability to recognize Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, is is something that. It separates us from the animals, right? And this is a point that Ghazali really wanted to drive home, and something that is fundamental to us. Because he said a person can know everything about this world, but if he doesn't know about Allah, then what benefit is that that body or that person? Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he says about them what? That they're actually, they're not ahya, they're um, what? They're actually dead. Why? We see them moving, right? We see them moving, we see them walking, we see them interacting. Why does Allah describe them as dead? <laughs> uh, he's describing their hearts. Ahsant. Right, he's describing their hearts. Their hearts are dead, meaning that they have no ma'rifah. They have no ma'rifah. They have no recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and because they have no recognition, they're, they're, just, they're just walking bodies. They're just moving bodies. They actually haven't been given that light. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. So this idea of ma'rifah is, you know, and he says here, and this is something he emphasizes, that even though a person might know something, if he doesn't know Allah, it's equivalent to him knowing nothing. And... So what is a sign for ma'rifah? What are some things that we should look for in ourselves to say, okay, you know, we're reaching a point or now we're starting to develop this recognition on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a very scary question because some of us might not have the answer to that. And if I don't have the answer to that, what do I need to do? Seek it. I need to start seeking it. And is there, is there anything wrong with seeking it today? No. Or seeking it late? No. no. Because it's, you know why it's not late? Because this is the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to open your heart. And just imagine if he decided never to open it. And just imagine if he decided to put a seal on it. That's something that's extremely dangerous and something that we should always seek refuge from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. And he says love. He says love is the fundamental, most basic characteristic, most basic uh, trait that an individual should have in order for him to recognize whether, or in order for him to see whether he has the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why does he summarize it with love? Out of all the characteristics, why love? Why is love so important? Because it's the thing that propels you to do for the, to please that individual. Ahsan, right? Love is the strongest motivational force an individual actually has. Because even anger, what happens with anger? Right, it goes away. Anger subsides, like hunger subsides, thirst subsides. But the, the main motivating factor that an individual has, that something that will push him all the way through and to paradise is this idea of having love. And, it, and who does an individual love? The one who he? The stranger? No, no. The, 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 one, he ah, the one who he knows. Yeah. And in order for me to know Allah, I mean, in order for me to love Allah, I need to, no, no. I need to know him. And I need to learn about him. And we said that there are two ways of learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are those ways? One is through ilm. One is through traditional knowledge. And the other way is through? Experience. Experiential knowledge. Mm -hmm. And experiential knowledge, making adhkar, making dua, and being intimate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having conversation with Him. This is a way of me developing a relationship with Him. Not everything needs to go through books, right? Not everything needs to sit down. Not everything needs to be learned. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he can open our hearts at any moment, at any time. And all of us have had that different experience at some point in our lives. Whether it be a certain dhikr, all of a sudden we feel that Allah has opened our heart to an understanding that in a way that we didn't realize before. Or sometimes we'll come across a verse that is completely relevant to a situation that I'm feeling or something that I'm facing at that time. That opening of our hearts, that is ma'rifa, that, that is love. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like we said, either whether it be seeking traditional knowledge and going through and actually sitting down, reading books, or whether it be through experiential knowledge, through adhkar, du through dua, these are all different ways of what? Achieving nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the muqarribin. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, if your fathers, sons, brothers, wives, tribes, the wealth which you have acquired, the trade which you fear will decline, and the dwellings you love are dearer to you than Allah and his messenger and the struggle in his cause, in a jihad, fi sabillah, then wait until Allah brings about his punishment. Allah does not guide those who break away. What do we think about this verse? What is he talking about here? And what is he weighing? I'm sorry. Oh, he's talking about love. Love of what? And, and look at these things individually, right? Fathers, sons, brothers, wives, tribes, wealth. The thing that we all dear. All right, these, these are things that we naturally love. And is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us not to love these things? No. Look, at the, look at the verse. Look, at the, look how beautiful this verse is. Is Allah telling us don't love our fathers, sons, brothers, tribes, etc.? Mm -hmm. No, he's not telling us don't love them. He's saying what? I'm sorry? Comparatively. Huh, comparatively. Comparatively what? What am I always supposed to put first and foremost every single time? Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is what is fundamental to the deen. Right? This, this is what separates us from all other religions, is, is our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our love of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what drives us. And is there is there an element of fear? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Allah, he... he uh, he scares us with the hellfire. He scares us with punishment. He scares us with displeasing him, right? Even that is a fear in and of itself. Mm. But ultimately, what is the thing? Even that fear is out of what? It's out of love. Mm. Even that, subhanAllah, look at that. Even that fear is within a context of love. Because there are other types of fear too, where someone, you're afraid of someone hurting you for the sake of hurting you, right? You're not, <laughs> you're not fear, you don't scare them because you're like, oh, you know, he's doing it because he cares for me, because he loves me. You actually fear that person because they're going to murder you, they're going to hurt you, because they dislike you. This is not the type of fear that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the fear that we have, and that's, it's, wallahi, it's amazing. The fear that we have of Allah is within the context of, of love. And even this idea of love, how, how is it that if love is the pathway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if love is the pathway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how is it that we pass this on? How do we teach others? By okay, by what? Good, good character, and good manners. By love itself. Yeah. If if I don't love the people around me, how can I teach them to love Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? Right. I have to be a practical example of that. If I don't show love to my friends, if I don't show love to my siblings, if I don't show love to my parents, if I don't show love to my children, then why will though if my children never learn how to love, how will they ever develop a relationship with their Creator? How? My, ch my children never learned how to love. And they're always hard-hearted. Because that's the opposite of loving, right? The loving heart is what? The one that cares. The one that looks at people and bleeds. The one that hears things and is upset. The one that is that's scared of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't teach that love, how do we expect to pass that down? How do we expect, how do we expect to become gateways to our communities, to our friends, to our families? If, if we ourselves don't, don't know how to express love. So the first symptom, he's going to talk about uh, a couple symptoms and he's going to give a couple examples. And I think this is actually a, a wonderful way of kind of giving us perspective on how to deal with some of these problems and some of these issues that we face. So he says in general that, okay, what if I love something more than Allah? This is the first example that he gives, right? If a person suffers from this, right? This is the symptom. He, lover, he loves something more than Allah. He might love gambling. He might love stealing. He might love lying. He might love cheating. Whatever the case might be, he might love wealth, right? There's so many things that an individual might love more than Allah. This is the first symptom, and Ghazali is going to talk about, okay, so how do we deal with this problem? What are some things that we can actually do to take care of this issue? So diseases are types, right? There are different types of diseases. Some are known, some are recognized, and others are not. In general, who is the one that recognizes the disease? Myself. 
Right. Well, my not always. Yeah. Right. Not always. Sometimes my throat is hurting. My ears are hurting. I know my throat, my throat and ear are hurting. But do I know what kind of illness I have? No. No. So what do I need to do? Right. I need to go to a physician. Right. I need to go to a physician. I need to go to the sheikh, or I need to go to a scholar to help me bring ilaj to help develop a treatment plan for the sickness that I'm facing. So he says, and even when there is medicine, so for example, if I have a headache, I know that I can take Tylenol to make my headache better, yes? Mm -hmm. Like I understand that this is a treatment for that. That what if I, I down a bottle of Tylenol? Mm -hmm. Right, it's, it's gonna be excessive. I, like I'm not taking the right amount that I should. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about this before. And if I take a half a tablet, what's gonna happen? Nothing, Nothing. there's gonna be no effect on that. And, you know, so either staying between too little and staying, you know, being too excessive, these are something and developing that balance is something that's really important. So there are people who they will submit to worldliness, right? Completely. Is, uh, I'm sorry, is the Instagram running? Can you just check? No, yeah, it is? Okay. Is it? Yeah, it is. It is? All right. Uh, so the submission to this worldliness, right? So we said that this is the first disease, this is the first problem where I love worldliness, right? I love worldliness. How do I deal with this now? Because I this is something that I might recognize and something that I might see. So he says that this person who loves worldliness, they might even do acts of worship. They might even pray. They might even fast. They might even give zakah. They might do all of these superficial actions. But he said that the reason that they're doing it, and this is scary, is because they're just customs. It's something that they've become used to and something they've become accustomed to, right? There, there's no, there's no purpose behind them. Like there's no, he, he himself is not sure why he's doing, he's just doing it because he's just going through the motions. His love of the world is so high. And, and subhanAllah, look at this person. He loves the world, but he's still doing acts. He's still doing good deeds. He's still doing these things. But the reasons he's doing them is wrong. So there are, how do I better myself? How do I better myself? I need to analyze these traits one by one. I need to analyze these traits one by one because is this love of worldliness, is this the only bad trait? No, no. no like we have <laughs> envy, pride, jealousy, right? Like there's so many negative traits that we have. The only way to deal with them is by actually tackling these issues one by one. And he talks about that focusing on trait by trait, it actually helps us develop a treatment plan. Because as we focus on these individual traits, eventually what's going to happen is that we conquer one, we conquer the next. And you slowly start moving through that and you, you will start snowballing. And it becomes that much easier to conquer those individual traits. So you guys remember this chart, right? So he's, what did we say? Or what did Ghazali talk about? He said that, okay, if, if I want to correct extravagance, what do I need to do? Right, I need to go to the extreme on the other side. Right? If I'm, uh, I'm extravagant and I just spend a lot of money, what do I need to do? I need to start hoarding it. Right? I need to start hoarding it and I start, need to start doing my best to save it. And I need to save to what? To what point? Until you, you get accustomed to loving and saving. Uh, until I get to the point where I just love saving too much. But what, what is the problem here is that sometimes it can, it can go, it can overdose, right? I can OD on that and I can go way too far. Where the point I, I, de I develop too much stinginess because the idea is to reset the gauge. It's not to break it, right? Mm -hmm. We have to reset the gauge. We're not trying to break this gauge. And, and redeveloping that gauge and resetting it is something that is really important and something that we need to do. So he's, he's going to talk about, all right, how do we set that gauge? How do we make sure that we only hit it right here so that when we bring it back to normal, what happens? It comes back to? Balance. The middle. And it comes back to the balance. And he said the most important thing about this balance point is what? That it's the furthest from the two extremes. The balance point is what is furthest from those two extremes. So how do we set? How do I set my personal gauge? So he said, first thing to do is take action. Right, you actually have to start acting, and you need to figure out what that blameworthy trait is. So this is something we are all capable of doing. If I find greed in myself. If I find extravagance in myself, if I find pride in myself, if I find superficiality within myself, and these are all things, how do I determine if I have these things or not? Do I really need to go and ask? Sometimes I have to, right? And who should I ask? My coach, my right, I can ask my mentor, I can ask my sheikh, and who else can I ask too? My family. I can ask my family and friends, right? If, if they are my true friends, and if they really do care for me, then they will point out my shortcomings.
and they'll tell me I have an ego. They'll tell me I have pride. They'll tell me the way I speak, it's belittling and it puts down people. And that is something that is really important because now I've recognized the blameworthy trait. So now that I know the action that leads to the blameworthy trait, what should I do? I should question myself, okay, how do I remove this trait? How do I take care of this trait? And then I would move in the other direction. I move in the other direction. And the reason I move in the other direction, like we said, is to bring that balance. And once I move in the other direction, I need to ask myself, which one of these states do I prefer? So the example we were talking about is love of the world, right? So love of the world, I start leaving the world, leaving the world, leaving the world. And I find I actually love leaving the world. Is it good to abandon the world? Not really. No, this is something, again, it's the other extreme and it is not something that is praiseworthy. But in my heart, I find that I'm actually starting to enjoy this. What happens now? What do I do in this situation? Huh, I have to come back. I have to come back. And this is how I gauge myself, right? So if uh, he, he gives an example here of reserving money. So basically there are people who deserve money, but I'm still, I still don't want to give it to them. Right? There are people who deserve money, but I still don't want to give it to them. He says, keep giving money until you get to a point where you enjoy giving it to people who don't deserve it. Like, <laughs> look, 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 look at the extreme that it goes to, right? So before you weren't even able to give money to people who needed it. Now you're willing to give people money who don't need it. And you're doing it happily. At this point, what do you do? You have to, Hold on. Huh? you come back. You come back and you return to the practice of withholding. So what's happening now? You're slowly... Right, the gauge is moving like this. You guys, you guys kind of follow that. So before it was like this, then you brought it to the other side, and then you're adjusting here, and that adjustment, right? It, eventually, it comes to start balancing itself out. And then after you get to that point, this point here, what is this? I'm basically monitoring my soul because my heart and my soul is always going to, it's always going to waver. There's always going to be taqallub. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed such this piece of flesh in our heart such that it's always turning. That's, what, that's why it's called the qalb. You guys know why it's called the qalb? Qalbi, yitqallab, because it's always turning. Right? Our hearts are always turning. And, and because of that, we always have to make sure that we are monitoring ourselves, make sure that we're questioning ourselves. And this is what the essence of mujahada is, right? This is what the essence of mujahada is. Eventually, I'll reach a point where I stop caring about money. I stop caring about giving it, and I, start ke and I stop caring about hoarding it. Right? There's, there's, no, there's no attachment. And now the money, ha what point does it reach is that it becomes a tool. The money now becomes a tool for what? Good deeds. Ah, for good deeds. And that's all I look at it as. I don't look at it as my personal money anymore. I only look at it as a means to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he talks about giving and withholding. How the attitude of the individual who is looking for this balance, what is the relationship to giving and withholding going to be? Okay. So my attitude, but I'm talking about my my feeling, my feeling toward giving and my feeling toward withholding. What are my feelings going to be? Which one am I going to lean toward? Giving. They're going to be equal. The, for the person who is balanced, whether it be giving or whether it be holding, it's going to be equal. Why? Because there are going to be situations that call for this, and there are going to be situations that call for this. And I have to make sure that my heart is not attached to the money. It's attached to the deed. It's attached to the deed because I want to get near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once an individual reaches that point where the giving and the withholding is equal, he succeeded. He succeeded. Is, it, is he done? No. No. He succeeded in this trait. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. In that particular trait, he's, he's done well and he's succeeded. But it doesn't mean that the work has stopped. Even in this trait, it means now he's figured out the way to master it. So is it easier or more difficult? Easier for now. Right now it's easier for him to keep an eye on that trait. So what does he do? Next. He moves on to the next one. And he keeps working in that way. And this is why uh, in Ghazali, he closes by saying that this individual will be with the Siddiqeen. He'll be with the Shuhada. He'll be with all of these people who bear witness to the truth. And he said, And how did this individual get here? Mujahada. Ha, through mujahada and correcting what? Not his ibadah, his, his, his character and his heart. So this, the straight, and he talks about here the straight path. You know, 
keep you moving between that. What are you, what are you actually trying to do? Trying to You're trying to balance and trying to get on the, on the Sirat al-Mustaqim. You're trying to get on the straight path. And he says that the balancing those two extremes is, is just like walking... Just like walking on the Sirat. This is the example that he gives. It's just like because you're constantly trying to bring that balance. And he says that any deviation, any deviation, whether it be this way or this way, what happens? The person is, hot, he's going to fall into hell, right? He's going to fall into the hellfire. And, but he said that no one is free of this deviation. Nobody's free of this movement. Everybody's trying to develop that balance. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ لَوَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَى رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيَّ ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ But every single one of you will approach it. And you approach what? Surat, surat. Huh? Not just, not the surat. Just He's talking about the hellfire. Ahsant. Every single one of you approach it. Everyone, any, because when I'm doing this, what's happening? I'm drawing what? I'm getting nearer to it. Every single one of you will approach it. A decree from your Lord. And this is something that every single person must face. But who is successful? Those individuals who have taqwa. And what did we say taqwa was? What is taqwa? God consciousness. What is God consciousness? Like you hear, you hear, you hear it's okay. Here, think about it. What I'm saying. What having it, good character. Okay, having good character. That's definitely part of it. But essentially, God consciousness, consciousness, or taqwa means con constantly, constantly struggling. Right, constantly struggling. Constantly struggling and trying to what? Because look, look at the whole context here. The whole context here, maintaining that balance. Is it when I'm balancing? Is it something that's natural or something I have to make an effort? I have to make an effort. And when I'm on that sirak, when I'm on that tightrope, when do I stop making effort? When, to, uh, when I'm done. <laughs> like when when I get to the other side, that's when I stop making effort. But the whole path, the whole journey, what do I have to do? I have to strive. I have to strive, and I have to work. And and who are the devout? Who are the muttaqin? It is those individuals who follow that straight path. Because a wali, is, it's not a difficult station. It's not a difficult station. It's not like this guy who's out in the mountains, like doing the No, that's not what it is. The wali is the mu'min and taqi. Is the believer who has taqwa. Very simply. I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm constantly working and striving to draw near to him. That person is a wali. That person is a wali. That person is muttaqi. And it is due to this, because it's not easy, right? Keeping that balance is not easy. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated the Fatiha in every rakah of every prayer. Because of the difficulty of it. And constantly striving for it. And developing that balance in our character. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those with balanced character. I mean. So uh, this is in Surah Hud. Fastaqim kama umirt. So keep to the right course as you have been ordered. And staying upright. And this is an order. When did Allah order this? And it's keep to the right course. When? Right now. Every single moment. Keep that course. Keep moving. Keep working. Keep striving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put blessing in every single step and in every single effort that you make. So... What is the key to salvation? What is the what will bring us to the end of that sirat? Through righteous actions and through doing good deeds. And where do those good deeds come from? They come from Husna Khulaq. They come from good character. That's where all of these things stem from. And what is what are things that are good character? A person who is generous, a person who is brave, a person who is loyal. Right. All of those good characteristics, a person who's honest, a person who's trustworthy. And what is the best example of this? Nabiyana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It's not the other way around. It's not because of good deeds that he became a person with good character. He had good character, which magnified his deeds. And this is the end of the chapter. This is what he mentions. Uh, you know, I love this book. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and I really enjoy the discussions and the examples that he gives. Um, but I thought it was a very nice example and a very, now we're starting to get into how to actually do the ilaj, how to actually bring treatment and how to actually correct ourselves. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a means of correcting ourselves. Amin. Wallahu ala musallahu ala khayra khalqin nabira Muhammad wa ala sahbi wa sallam. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Does that go along along the lines of you know, pursuing these because like you're on autopilot, it's just like, oh, it's my duty. Just, okay. Like, there's no thought behind it. Okay, so th that's that's a good question. It depends on the frequency of of that happening. So are there times where we're doing the deeds just to go through the motions? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and what what did we say about Iman? How does does Iman move like this? No. How does it move? Right, it, it goes like this, man. There, there's going to be times where it's up. There's going to be times where it's down. What is the important thing at, when it's down? What do we do? Try to raise it up. We'll try to raise it up by what? Actions. By keep doing actions, right? Because e even even what did you call it? You call it you call it autopilot, right? Because now you've reached a plateau. You've reached a plateau, and once you reach that plateau, you don't want the plateau to drop. So what do you do? At the minimum, you got to keep the engine running. You keep the engine running through those good deeds, and then you need to what? You need to do some introspection. You need to start analyzing, okay, what's going on? And a lot of us, you know, this is the beauty of, of khalwa and it's the beauty of qiyam, you know, that you have that time alone. And, and I think that's something that many of us are really scared of. We're, ter we're terrified of having conversation and being alone with ourselves because we're afraid of what we might see. The only thing that's stopping me from seeing myself, my true self, when I'm alone is my ego. Because our ego wants to constantly put up this image that I'm a good person, I'm doing good things, who wants to look in the mirror and be like, I hate the person who I see? Like, nobody wants to see that. But even in that situation, that's tawfiq from Allah. That's a blessing from Allah. That I'm able to actually recognize that. What if I never recognize that? I went through life as an ugly person. But because I'm able to recognize it, what can I do then? Fastaqim, right? Then at that point, I can fix it. I can work on it. I'm saying even recognition is tawfiq. Even recognition is a blessing. And even recognition is a sign that I'm doing something right. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting deeds from you, you know what He does? He gives you tawfiq to do more. And sometimes it might not be the way that we imagine it. We think that it means coming to the masjid more. No, sometimes it means becoming a better person, becoming a nicer person, becoming more personable. Having people love being around you. Being happy when somebody enters the room, right? These are all, and when we think of those characteristics, who's the first one that come to come to mind? Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, he he would lighten up the room when he came in. People people would run to go see him and meet him and hear him and listen to him just because they loved him so much and because he was lovable. <laughs> it wasn't be you can't order love. You can't. It's impossible. Love has to be developed. When we have disease, uh, we should visit the physician, he said. Yeah. And Hazal mentioned an interesting moment uh, which caught my mind is what if the physician himself is sick? Ah, I sent. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, sure. So, so the thing is, just because somebody does a lot of adhkar or somebody has sought a lot of knowledge, does, that, does it mean that that person is a good person to go to? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. So how do I determine if somebody is a good physician? Near to Allah, if he makes uh, you near to Allah, uh, right, you, you can actually feel it. So, the thing is, if when I go to a regular physician, right, and he keeps giving me medicine and like I don't feel better, what do I do? Huh? Another right, I go to another physician. I'm like, all right, this guy sucks. Like, I need to go, I need to go somewhere else. And, and, and just, I don't, I think that this has become part of our culture that where we feel when we go to a sheikh, the sheikh has all the answers. Mm -hmm. When the reality is that sheikh might not be in any better position than me or you. <laughs> and and sometimes, sometimes people take advantage. And that's something, it's scary, but it's something that we need to recognize. Spiritual abuse is real. It, it is a real thing. And, and getting into a position where a person is well known, it is, it is a fitna. It is a fitna for a lot of people. And, and sometimes without knowledge, without education, without any of these, you know what I mean? Without any practice. They're, Allah just puts them in this place of fitna and they don't have the, the bravery to step down 
and say, no, this is not for me. This is not who I'm supposed to be. And then we go to them thinking that this person is the one that we should seek from. We have knowledge. But our hearts tell us. Our hearts tell us a lot of times when we go, we're like, he, well, he, he, he gives us something like, man, I'm not really feeling anything. We go back, like, I still don't feel any better. I, I don't think, I think this, no, 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 this, he's, he's a sheikh. And we, and we lie to ourselves. It's amazing. <laughs> like, it's amazing how man lies to himself in order to follow, because he's like, man, all these people can't be wrong. Well, of course they can. And you know why? Because my heart is telling me it's wrong. Yeah. Hold on, you have something to say? Don't have a oh, okay. So there's somebody online asking what will be the difference between Iman and Taqwa? Uh, uh, Iman is belief, right? Iman is belief in the unseen. Taqwa is constantly being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our, in our actions, right? Constantly questioning ourselves. I Iman is a point where you believe that Allah exists, mm -hmm. right? Iman is a point where you believe the angels and the books. All of those things are 100% true. Mm -hmm. Taqwa is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I shake anybody's hands, before I sit down, before I eat before I address my wife, before I get in my car, right? That's taqwa. Having a constant awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I, 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 I yeah. heard uh, this, this example of, of Iman and taqwa. Maybe, uh, Iman is when you're driving you're on, yeah. on, on, on the way, you know the public, the taqwa exists. Yes. You know, but taqwa is, you know, it's behind you, so you drive correctly and well, <laughs> even if it's not. Yeah, Allah mustan. Allah mustan. And, and, and taqwa is... And what is the other relationship? That the more taqwa I have, the more, yaqeen the more yaqeen I'm going to have, and the more iman I'm going to have. Um, how, how do we know um, that love for a person that we have is for, for, for the sake of Allah? We have, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So how do we know, uh, so if I love a person, mm -hmm. how do we know that this love is for Allah's sake? Okay, so there are different types of love, right? So if I love my mother, for example, that's, that's a natural love, right? Or I love my wife. Or my children, right? These, this is all natural love. Loving someone for the sake of Allah, how do I know that? By asking myself. And, and, and like I said, some questions we don't want to ask ourselves. Like we, we don't, we're scared because we're scared of the answer. And, and I think that, that is something that is very fundamental and something that we shouldn't be scared of asking ourselves. Like, why am I friends with this person? Well, what am, what am I getting out of this relationship? And, and what, I, don't, I don't mean like, okay, what kind of money, you know, is, I mean like, is it give it? No. Am, through this relationship, am I drawing nearer to Allah? Am I becoming better? Am I becoming a better person? Is he becoming a better person? Right? You know, there, there are a number of questions that need to come into play when we talk about these, these individual relationships that we have with people. You know, are, are there certain signs that we look for? Yeah. Um, you know, I feel spiritually, I feel better. When, I, when I'm around this person, I want to do more good deeds. When I'm around this person, I want to do, I'm, I'm more afraid. I'm more shy to do bad deeds. Right, you know, I, I think those are all very good signs, you know, and telling. It's not necessary because it might be out of fear of that person, but you know, these are just some markers that we can look for. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this beautiful compass in our in our chests to, and, and we just have to be honest with ourselves. And if we really are, then we'll find that there's, it, we will make huge shifts in in the way we deal with each other and we we speak about each other and the way we talk to each other. Sometimes I feel like this, the modern world sort of designed to make us sick, spiritually sick, mm. and it's unavoidable. Like you said, that, um, you know, like being the well, he's not like some dude in the mountains mm -hmm. doing vicar, but sometimes I feel like that may be the only way in today's environment to, to, to truly draw near to Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, yeah, man asbara ala nas min man he said, the one who is patient with the, uh, what's, what's a good way, with the annoyment of the people <laughs> is better than the one that leaves them. Because you're not, because you're not, you're, okay, who, how am I being tested if nobody's around me? Hmm. Where's the test? If I'm not actually dealing with people, and, and not just that, I'm not dealing with people. Also, nobody's dealing with me. With me. And why am I separating myself? Because I think I'm better? To protect your, protect your soul. Because I'm, yeah, to protect myself from the evil people. Because I'm better than all of them. Mm, but, <laughs> you, 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 you say, like, we're all prone to evil. Like, no, one's... no, no, we're not. We're not, we're not prone to evil. Yeah. We're, we're prone to be disbalanced. Right? And we're, we're prone to lean toward one thing or another. Not, none of the, like, a, a lot of these characteristics we had talked about, like even very on a very fundamental level. Did we say anger was bad? 
No. Did we say that desire was bad? No, no right? It's, it's the way that these things are channeled. That, that's all. And, and as for the, the availability of sins, I mean, I would argue that there are certain sins that are more available than others in, in the past. There's no doubt about that. But sin has been part of the undercurrent of the Muslim Ummah since, since Adam, alayhi salam. It's a sin, like, you know, we didn't invent sin now. It, you know, was zina around during the time of the Prophet yeah. yeah, drinking alcohol, substance abuse, lying, cheating, like, you know, killing, murder. All of these things are always there. It's, it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, we're facing all of these things today. Um, and, and someone, oh, well, you know, it wasn't as available. No, I mean, you knew, people knew where the brothels were. And somebody coming to the masjid constantly drunk, obviously, <laughs> he could get access to the alcohol. So, you know, getting access to these things or getting access to certain things, like, it's like, I'm sorry. No, no, and, and no, oh, the, the social stigma was even harsher back then, right? You know what I mean? Like, like, hitting, like the, yeah, the, yeah. The, I mean, so so the thing is, like, you you have all these things. Even even committing zina, how would anybody know that you're committing zina? That you you need witnesses for that, yeah. uh, or you for for witnesses. Yeah. You need witnesses for that. So the thing is, if you're doing it privately, who knows? That's true. Even even the even Omar radiallahu. I'll I'll, I'll I'll you know I'll, I'll end with this point. Even Omar radiallahu. He went to Hadith and what did he say? Am I in the, in the yeah, he said, am I, am, I, you know, am I from the munafiqeen? He used to go follow Hudayfa to figure out who was a munafiq and who's not. And he, to the point, he couldn't tell the munafiq from the Muslim. And, and the munafiq, he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe. And he couldn't, he couldn't look at the people and tell who was a munafiq and who wasn't. Like these, these sins and these things and these hardships and these difficulties, they're nothing new. Like no, nothing's changed. But back to, to be devil's advocate, like yeah. back then they had companions, you know, like, yeah, I only see companions like once a week, twice a week mm -hmm. for like an hour. But for most of my time, I'm amongst these people who today they don't even recognize a lot for the most part, it seems mm -hmm. like. Whereas so, back then, even the mm -hmm. polytheists, they had like values and principles that they lived by. So they don't have values and principles where we live? Okay, yes. Honesty isn't upheld? You know, being uh, making sure that you're following procedure, being trustworthy. Why? Why is it that I'm more comfortable buying something from a Target than I am the halal store? Mm -hmm. Those, those. I mean, a lot of times, like we look at American society and we're like, "Oh, look how bad it is." It's not. There, you know, it's re it's really not. You, you, if you want to look at problems in society, I, I suggest you know for everyone here, travel the world, and look how common something as simple as bribery is. Something that most of us probably haven't experienced experience on a day-to-day -day basis in America, honestly. And it's so underlooked in the rest of the world. Like it's some, it's like it's a part of their day-to-day -day life. Over here, it's difficult for me to even imagine bribing someone. And like I ask myself, like, how do you even bribe someone? Like to, to that point. So you know, there's going to be good and bad everywhere. There's there's no doubt about that. And everybody's going to be principled in some way, shape, or form. There's no doubt about that either. The the important thing is, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? As an individual, as a person, how am I striving? What am I doing to better myself? And with all of these things around me, even though those, you know, even Islam, Islam is a, it's not a destructive religion, right? It's it's not. It's even the Prophet when he came, he didn't come to destroy everything. He came to build on already good things. Mm. Like, even even us being here, like we, many of us have taken the good characteristics from American culture and are trying to build on those things. Like we want to be in time. We, we will stand in line, you know, <laughs> like in, I mean, I mean, very, very basic things that we, we don't even think about. And, it, and if you look at a lot of the problems that are overseas, like these aren't, you don't see these things, common courtesy, you know, this like personal space, like none of this stuff is respected. Not to say that, you know, they don't have their own good characteristics. I'm just talking about, like, and I don't mean to exemplify it and say, oh, like, you know, the rest of the world sucks, like, yeah. even though it does. But, like, it... <laughs> <laughs> no, but a, yeah. that's, a, that's a big point. Yeah. That's a very good point. Because, mm -hmm. like, like you said, bribing any country I go to, you would you pick it up and you just sort of, $20, you, you sort of got $10, you'd be like, no, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, no, you go to Target and be like, give it to me. Yeah, yeah, actually, like, we take I'm it for, no, no, we, we, ta we take I'm it for granted. No, we, we take it for granted. We, we, we really do take it for granted. Like, when was the last time I got into an argue with an Uber driver? And when was the last time I got argue with a taxi driver overseas? 
No, no, I, yeah. really just very small, simple things like, you know, are, are going trying to pay a bill, like, you know, so, simple things like that. And again, you know, what I mean, like, I don't mean to exemplify the problems in, in a lot of our, our countries of origin. But I, I do mean like, okay, if there are positive things, those things need to be exemplified. And those, those values should enrich our Islam more. And when I look around and I deal with my coworkers, I deal with all those things, you know what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to be a sponge for what? For good. Right? I take all the good characteristics that I see in the people around me. And, and you'll find that there, there is two types of da'wah, right? There's passive and there's active. What is passive da'wah? What are some things? Just being, nice just being nice. Just being nice. Being kind, just talking. You know what I mean? Just interacting. Smiling. Like, you know, smiling and like, you know, and, and holding principle, being principled. It's actually works more than the active one. Yeah, and, and, and many times it works more. And even how, when people come to Islam, nobody's like, wait, I heard you guys pray all night. Can I, can, can I, can I, like, can I be part of that? Mm. Like, th that's not, it's, it, a lot of them is because, man, I really had a good dealing. I had a good time. Like, this, this person is so nice. Like, why do you guys do this? Like, I, I see how much respect, like, you know, these kids are giving their father. Like, how do, you know, that, I want that. You know, and that's what that nobody says like, oh, wow, you guys fast for a whole month. That sounds amazing. Right. That's not. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> and I, I don't I don't mean to belittle the ibadat. You know, that's that's not my point. My, I don't. Th those are definitely ways to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the end of the day, it, it is not like the actual ritual worship that the people are attracted to. It's, it's good traits. Even when the people came to the Prophet, they didn't. Why did they accept? They accept it because they're like, yeah, you, you, you look like a truthful guy. You look like an honest guy. Yeah. Yeah, you're truthful and you're trustworthy. You're honest, you're trustworthy. And for most people, that's enough. Like, what teaches you be, to be so honest? What teaches you to be so trustworthy? Like, why is it that you, you know, why is it that you walked away from the register and you realized I didn't ring it up and I went back and I'm like, hey, you didn't ring me up for this. This, this is the type of stuff that really... Like, and people are attracted to that. Like they're attracted. We, we, and, and the reason I say that is that if people weren't attracted to honesty, why are they so happy when good things happen? And how come they're not as happy when bad things happen? Our fitrah. It's our natural inclination to love good things. It's our natural inclination to love truth, to love honesty, to love goodness. You know, nobody's like, yeah, murder, yeah, rape. You know, like these are great. No, nobody, nobody likes those things. And you'll find that you Muslims, non-Muslims, atheists, whoever the case might be, everybody's willing to stand together on those things, yes? Mm. Why? Because it's our natural state. Like people are naturally inclined to want to do good. I, I really believe that. And if I didn't, I'd probably be pretty depressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I come across often when Muslims have this perverted, uh, perverted uh, idea that mm. all non-Muslims are necessarily evil. Yeah, they may have evil theology, evil. Mean, yeah. they may do shit. This is different evil. Yeah, yeah. Themselves as personal, they may be even. They would. They might be better than most Muslims. They, they might. Yeah, they might have better traits than some Muslims. I agree. Like yeah. today, today, a story of that actually, uh -huh. a lady came to me. And asked me why I don't hire all Muslims. Yeah. And I got upset actually. Mm. And she was, uh, I looked at her and I was like, um, how do you know that a Muslim could come and steal from me? Mm. Why are you telling me that I need to hire all Muslims? Yeah. It's like I'll feel more comfortable. Okay. I mean, the thing is, so like, your personal like, cover, yeah. People actually say that, you know, they yeah. like. No, and I, I think I think that is something that it's, it is perverse you know, to, to believe that. It, because we also have developed this culture where it's like us versus them, right? We, we've developed that culture. That's not the case. I can guarantee for you, most, most non-Muslims don't care. Like, <laughs> I'll tell you very honestly, are there some who do? And are there some who went like the destruction of Islam? Yes, absolutely. I, I have no doubt in my mind. The vast majority of them, they don't care. They just care about making money and they just care about living their lives. You know, they, they could, they could, no, no, they, they, people want to mind their own business. You know, the biggest problem of the Muslims today the Muslims, throughout history, you can write it down. The only obstacle in front of the Muslim success has been other Muslims. It's not been the Zionists. It's not been Israel. It's not been the West. It's not been, you know, all, you know, all of these concussions. No, man. They're out to preserve themselves. That's it. 
They're out to protect their nation. They're out to protect their city. They're out to protect their interests. They're out to protect those things. They're not out to get Islam. If they're out to get Islam, why did they build it? let us build masajid? Why did they let us build funeral homes? Why did they let us build institutions? Why? Like, what kind of plan is this? I don't know. You know, it's like, how, this, how many organizations do we have that are recognized by the government? Yeah. Like, the government actually employs Islamic relief for emergency services. Yeah. Like, what kind of plan is this? Like, it, if this is the plan to bring down Islam, they're doing a terrible job. <laughs> what if it's like 4D chess, though? 4D chess, really? Listen, let them keep playing. Because I still think they're doing a terrible job. It's like, all right, the goal is to let them prosper and get really good and start converting, you know, the my population like crazy. Personal, my personal opinion, I think yeah. people want to hear what they want to hear. My no, I, I think people look for an enemy. It, I think people look for somebody to blame other than and themselves. That's what I mean, my, yeah. They want to hear what they want to yeah, hear. yeah. No, no. It's it's easier to blame the kuffar. It's easier to blame the Jews. It's easier to blame the West. It's easier to blame this. No. Have to look at our, no, no, no. Our, our Echi, the only person we have to blame is us. I'm the only person to blame. That's it. There's, there's no this this victim mentality. Echi, it's completely anti-Islamic. No, no, it's it's right. It, I, I agree yeah. on that part. I mean, people come and park in handicapped all the time. They won't do that at a shopping center. No, and it, but, they'll and, do it here. No, no, and the thing is, like, I'm part. Why are you parking in the handicap? Because it's a masjid. Sorry, guys. I work at security here. So yeah. I, no. It, I, I can. I can. Yeah. You know. No, no. I mean, and, <laughs> but but the thing is, like, you know, all these things. It's it's our our biggest obstacle is our own ego. Period. That's true. Simple. We we remove the ego. We remove the problems. Someone said. Uh, Creating your lines for the Allah, creating your lines of Allah, protect us and you know make it make us upright and give us good characters. Neighbors around him must be frustrated and miss an entitled seeing all of that mass during the Juma, during the Tarawih. Yeah, and they say, Oh, look at these Muslims, and that and that's the thing. Um, so I live behind the measure myself, and I used to have people park because they knew I was there without my permission. <laughs> my wife will call me like, I'm trying to leave. And I'm stuck, yeah. Cars. I would start towing cars, people stop. <laughs> I, don't know, like, I don't care, you're my friend. I don't care. Did you, you don't call me? True. Did you ask my permission? Yes. Like, you know what I mean? You don't go to this park because you're I, running late. I asked Allah's yeah. permission. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got cash. <laughs> Even like 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 uh, like other people that staff members they live behind here, people park in their lives without their permission. Without their permission, they tow all the time. Yeah. I love that car. This is this is you have to you have to you have to respect other people. No, no, and the thing is that the more the more we respect each other, the more professional we are. The more we love the more we love each other. You know, and we again every everybody loves organization. You know, everybody loves coming to the masjid and it's clean. Everybody loves coming to the masjid and the rows are straight. Everybody loves everybody loves coming to the masjid and having a place to put their shoes and having you know carpet to put down and the AC running. Right? Nobody loves chaos. Nobody likes walking to the masjid. You know, it's like all dirty. You know, your your heart is not in it. If if I'm walking into the masjid and I see dirt on the carpet, how comfortable am I going to be praying? I'll pray. I'd be like the whole so time no no yeah i won't come back or the whole time i'm just gonna be like oh my god this place is so disgusting like you know what i mean and it's it, well we have we have to fix ourselves we really do we really have to fix ourselves but. you think also Sheikh, that the problem for this is also misunderstanding of the islam yes but the misunderstanding from islam why why are we misunderstanding because they just think islam is kind of yeah it's, no, it's because our own nafs yeah yeah, he's our, it's, I'm telling you, all of these problems, they stem from nafs. That we, we are so arrogant that we refuse to go and learn the religion. We're so arrogant that we think we own the religion. We're so arrogant that I can tell other people how to practice religion. Mm. Yeah, what? Who? Oh, you always think that this is the right thing to do. You don't go back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... It, you know, like who, who, who made you the fossil? 
Who made you the judge? Where you come in and be like, no, your salah is not accepted. Yes. No, you, your, your pants are too high. No, your pants are too low. No, your beard's not long enough. No, you know, how, you, how did you do this? How you do this? Oh, Sheikh, go talk to him. He's just like, hey, why? He came to the masjid, he prayed. He's like, no, man, like, well, you know, somebody needs to talk to him. Uh, your son is not even coming for salah. You want me to go talk to this guy? Mm -hmm. No, no, I, it, it's so strange to me. Like, really, it's strange to me that we're, we're not willing to criticize ourselves, but we're, we're ready to criticize others. Like, you know, I, I've, I failed as a father, but I'm going to make sure that I yell at everyone else. Why? Why? Yeah. The friendships and, or the sheikh who gives you that spiritual youth and like what you feel and sure. whatnot. Um, so let's say you have like acquaintances who are Muslim, mm -hmm. and you know you don't really get that boost from being around them, mm -hmm. but you feel like you're impacting them, where it's kind of. You know, and then it's just like, what do you do? You should, there's always that yeah, you still have to love them. Uh -huh. I mean, for them, but then there's that whole like. I mean, the, the, so like, I, I know, yeah, sure. So we uh, like the we use this example quite a bit. Like when we're on the plane and the mask drops, what, what do you got to do? Myself. Oh, you got to save yourself. And even Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, what does He tell us? <laughs> save yourselves and your family from the hellfire. Uh, and the and the reason I say that is because a lot of times we we enter like this this white knight savior mode. Like, man, if I don't tell them, who is going to Allah will protect his religion. Allah doesn't need me. All right. I should take opportunities to participate for sure, no doubt. But even in that relationship, if I'm the only one giving in the relationship, what, what do we call that? It's a toxic relationship. And the only thing I'm doing, I'm, I'm being an enabler. I'm not being a friend. Friend is always give and take, always. And, and the thing is, with, with friends, you know, Muslim or not, it's, it's irrelevant. Like I, I have some very good non-Muslim friends. With, the, with the, there is give and take. Like sometimes they'll give me advice on like how to mentor certain things, how to deal with certain things. It, it might be from a financial, it might be from social, not necessarily spiritual, but I'm still getting something from them. Does that, does that make sense? Right, you know, so there is give and take. It just might not be on a spiritual level, but that's not the, that's not the role of those friends. You know, some friends I, ha I will have as financial advisors. Some friends I will have as, you know, mental health therapist advisors, like, hey, how do I counsel? How do I deal with this situation? And they'll give me techniques and they'll give me strategies. So it's very important to make sure that we're compartmentalizing those friendships in a certain way. But if I feel I'm in a, like my relationship is like, okay, I have to guide this person. That who, you, you don't guide who you love. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides. And, and if I'm, the, again, if I'm the only one that's giving, the only thing I'm doing is enabling. I'm not, I'm not helping anybody in the relationship. I'm, I'm actually just making it worse for this person. It's like giving a gambler money. What do you think he's going to do with it? He's just going to squander it. And I think friendships are tough because they're voluntary relationships. And just sometimes getting up and walking away, it's, it's hard. Any other questions? No. Do we have any questions on mine? No, this one is done. Nothing in the chat. Awesome. Then we'll end here. Subhanakallah. We'll end here. We'll end here. We'll end here. We'll end here. We'll end here.